we have lots to tell you, but people also wanted questions answered, so we'll do a bit of both. Answer a bit, talk a bit, tell a story or two, and uh, see where we go. Why was it that the tree was the, called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Why not just the tree of evil only? And was, what was good about it? Do you want to say so? <laughs> Freedom of choice was bought or created at a price. The highest price ever paid in the universe. It cost the price of the Son of God. But freedom of choice requires exactly that, choice. You cannot have a choice if you only have good or if you only have evil. There must be a choice between good and evil. And every single one of us gets to the point where we have to choose whether we want to have evil in our lives or whether we want to have good in our lives. You can choose to stay away from evil and then you have chosen the good. Or you can choose the good and reject the evil. So it had to be the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Recently I became aware of the idea being taught that Allah is the same God as the God of the Old Testament. That Allah is Jehovah. I do know of the similarities between Islam and SDA such as temperance etc. However, this teaching seems uncomfortable. Can someone shed light on this issue and direct towards the truth? You know what the Reformers taught? The Reformers taught that Catholicism is the Antichrist. They taught that he sits in the temple of God pretending to be God. In other words, he puts on a cloak of Christianity when he is in reality the enemy of Christ. He negates him at every possible turn. He wants to get rid of Christ as mediator. He places other bodies, saints, Mary, church, hierarchy, whatever, in Christ's place. The Bible says, he who says that he didn't come in the flesh is antichrist. Catholicism teaches that Christ did not come all the way down. He didn't come all the way down. Because Mary was immaculate, he didn't come all the way down. And so he is up there somewhere and needs intermediaries to get to him. So the teaching is no one comes to the Father except through Christ, but no one comes to Christ except through Mary. So there's always an intermediary, so Catholicism fits that bill. But they also taught that Islam is the open antagonist towards Christianity. The Quran teaches that Jesus never died on the cross. The Quran teaches that Jesus, by a miracle, was spared the indignity of the cross and was taken to heaven without death, out seeing death. That removes the atonement. And so Islam denies the atonement of Jesus Christ. Islam also denies the deity of Jesus Christ because they say that that is polytheism. But Christ is the Godhood made accessible to its creation. 
If you have seen him, you have seen the Father. And so he is the son, S-O-N, of the Godhood. And we can identify through Christ and come to God, which the Bible calls Father, through Christ. So if Islam denies the Godhood of Christ, denies the death, denies the atonement, and says that God has no son, then is it the same God as the Bible, yes or no? No. He's not the same God of the Bible, even if he tells you not to eat pork. He's not the same God of the Bible. Does that mean we must be vindictive towards Islam as an enemy of Christ? No. But we must be straightforward when it comes to rebuking a false doctrine concerning Christ. And you can look it up in the spirit of prophecy where it says Mohammedism has its converts but they deny the divinity of Jesus Christ. If this doctrine is not Counted by the people of God, we are not doing our duty. So there are elements of contact between Islam, but we're not serving the same God. And anybody who does evangelism with the people of Islam will have to realize that they, just like anyone else out there, that teaches salvation by works will have to be called out of that system to the true God who teaches salvation by grace. Amen. And I don't know whether that answers the question, but that's what it's like. I know I receive flack for saying that. I go even further. I go further. But I don't want to go there today, but I'll just leave a thought with you. If the one is a clandestine, behind-the-scenes enemy of Christ, and the other one is an open antagonist to Christ, don't they have the same boss? Leave it at that. Uh... What about having leaders of other denominations training Seventh-day Adventists to make effective our church? What has light and darkness got in common? Nothing. Nothing. What does the spirit of prophecy say about that? She said they may not preach from our pulpits. She goes even further. She says that a minister who eats meat shouldn't preach from the pulpit, let alone one from another denomination. The only time I would be happy to embrace any one of them to preach from our pulpits if he embraces the truth. But I'm not the standard, nor the Talmud. The spirit of prophecy is the, is the standard and the testimony to the church. Don't believe what I say. Look it up in the testimonies. Because what I say is not important. What God says is important. Amen. What is the highest level of masonry? And is it true that all Catholic priests are masons? The highest level of masonry is the 32nd degree. Thereafter you have an honorary degree, which is the 33rd degree, and not all Catholic priests are masons. Many Catholic priests are Masons, but not all Catholic priests are Masons. I want to tell you a little story. The Bible says, And the kings of the world gave their power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast. And they said, Who is like unto the beast? Who can make war against him? It also tells me that the kings of the world will raise up a banner which honors the first beast and will make it the standard for the world. Does the Bible teach that? Yes or no? Does it teach that in Revelation 13? Yes or no? 
Yes, of course it teaches that. So, who's the number one boss according to the Bible? The beast. And the other beast that comes out of the earth is a lackey because he does on his behalf what the first one wants and he forces everyone, small and great, rich and poor, to follow the first beast. So he's a lackey. Who's he? It's your great nation. I won't be popular for saying that, but I don't say it. The Bible says it. Okay, so we know that the number one power on the planet is the beast. If I cannot see it, if I see the mighty banking systems run by Jewish bankers, or I see the mighty this, or the mighty Islam, or the mighty this, or the mighty that, my Bible tells me who's number one. The beast. Then I must say to myself, well, if he's the beast, but he doesn't, if he's number one, but he doesn't seem to be number one, then maybe he's number one behind the scenes. Is that a logical conclusion? Yes. Maybe he's number one behind the scenes. The whole world will follow the beast. Wonder after the beast. The whole world. That means somehow he must get the whole world to do this. But if you look at the world, it doesn't look like it. So I say to God, you know what? They deceived me all my life. Are they not deceiving everyone else as well? Because my Bible says it must be like this. Then I read who controls the world and I see mm, the Jewish bankers control the world. It's a Jewish conspiracy. My Bible doesn't say the Jews control the world. The Bible says your house has been left to you desolate. Lord, this doesn't fit into the picture. It's not biblical. I'm just giving you my, my reasoning. It's not biblical. There must be something behind the scenes here that we do not see. So I start researching. After all, they tricked me into believing their lies. Maybe they're lying to everyone. And I find all these things. And I find the secret this and the secret that. And I have access to some books that nobody else had access to. Through my father-in-law, when he died, I got a lot of books. But I'll tell you a little story. Before he died, before he died, he knew he was dying. And he was weak. And he had all these books, and he had to take them back to the esoteric societies before his death. But he wasn't capable of carrying them, and he was stressing about it. So he asked me whether I would help him just take books to a certain place. And there were heavy boxes of books. So I asked my son to come and help me. I didn't know where we were going. And he didn't tell me. So we took all these boxes of books. And we went to a place called the Sun Temple. And when we walked into the Sun Temple, I said, Ooh, ooh we're in an esoteric temple. And this was the place where the channel of Africa lived. Every continent has a channel. And that channel receives information from the boss. <laughs> Thanks. And that information is disseminated to the rest of the world. And as I walked in there, it was in a triangular shape. It had a purple carpet and it had a pulpit. And the pulpit said, uh, Age of Aquarius. And there were speakers from the top, and there were fantastic tables all around, and uh, really posh. And we brought the books there, and my father-in-law thought, well, bring them in and we'll go out. And then this channel was chatting to my father-in-law. My father-in-law was a bit uncomfortable and embarrassed, and I still said to my son, pray, we're on the devil's ground. And then the channel of Africa came to me and said to me, ah, 
are you the son-in-law? And I said, yes. And he assumed I was an insider. And so he started showing off. And he said, come, let me show you around. And I said, okay. And we went and uh, I played along and he showed me his library and then he showed me letters written to presidents and prime ministers of countries with answers from them about esoteric information and how it should be implemented in government and all of these links. And I was getting all the info I wanted. And as we left there, my father-in-law said mm, something I won't repeat, and then he said, you mocked him. And yes, I did milk him. So this is not a conjecture. This is not a conjecture. And anyway, while I was... Um, am, I, am I talking too much here? All right. So behind the scenes, channels were communicating. He also showed me who attends his meetings. High government officials, high sports officials, and high medical officials. The highest of them all. Those were all the ones that were involved that would come to the seance meeting to receive channeled information as to what had to happen in every single one of those fields. This is first-hand information. I didn't look for it. It came my way. All right? When uh, once I was in a hurry, and he was very sick, and uh, I ran into his house once, and the stepmother was there, and I ran in there without prayer. Now before I had no problem, access to all of this, I was part of that world, but I was now a Seventh-day Adventist. And I went into that house, not thinking, being busy. You know, we're always busy and I didn't pray. And I thought, you know, I've been in that house many times with them. I mean, I used, they used to be on you know, the same wavelength as I. I went into that house. She was in her room in audience. So she couldn't come out immediately. And I went in without praying. And I was still irritated. I had to get out there and do something and I had to get something from her. And next morning something hit me in the side here. And I went down like a ton of bricks in her kitchen. And I was writhing in pain on the floor. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't move. I was absolutely paralyzed with pain. And then I heard her finishing up and I prayed. I said, God, please forgive me. I went in here without praying. That's presumption. But please, for the honor and glory of your name, don't let her see me like this. I couldn't get up. I couldn't move. And then our door opened and she was starting to come down the passage. And I said, God, please let me get up. Please, I don't want her to see me like this, not for my sake, but for your name's sake. And the, just before she got into the kitchen, I could get up. I was still in pain, but I could hold my pose and pretend I didn't have pain. Don't think this is just some airy-fairy story. This is a real war. This is a real war. And I said to God, God, there is so much deception out there. How do these things link together? How do these secret societies link together? And I got all these heavy documents from all these masons, and I don't want any of you ever to read them. They are satanic. They are evil. They make God the devil, and the devil they make God. And these are the highest masons in the country. And I have their books, and I have, and how I got them, I can tell you that as well if you're interested. How I got some of the books that I couldn't get any other way. In any case, this stuff is evil. And I did read, but remember, I came from that world. I didn't read it now 
because I'd read it before, many of the stuff, of the little lower grades. I wasn't into the top grade stuff, which I got hold of later. I didn't read it to find out what is the devil's strategy and how does it all work. I didn't read it out of curiosity. I hated it. I loathed it. I said, God, show me that I can call people out of this darkness into your wonderful light. Don't you ever read it. It's disgusting. I have a different calling. I was called to do evangelism. And hundreds of Freemasons have been baptized because of this ministry. 36 in one campaign down in the south of your country alone. All over the world. People have come and thrown their Freemason regalia at our feet. All over. But I didn't have the link. I didn't have the link between Catholicism and the running of the secret societies. I didn't have the link. And I was lecturing in Germany. And I had the picture. I had all the pieces of the puzzle. They were coming together. And I had this piece and that piece and that piece. And I knew they had to link somewhere. And I said so in the lecture. They have to link. This is my early lectures. But I didn't have the links. And that night everybody walks out of the hall. And I'm the last one. I'm always the last one out. People ask questions, and in those days you still had to pack slides away. It wasn't like today, you close your computer, you put it in your bag, you're out of there. No, 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 you give two lectures, you have the hundreds of slides to resort back into their place. And I was walking outside, and the others had been packing the van, and were getting ready, the equipment was gone, and I walked down the passage. And as I walked down this passage, a hand grabbed me and pulled me into a closet. I thought, that's it, I'm dead. And the voice said to me, if you, if you turn around and you see me, then you will die. And he said, what you said tonight is very dangerous, but what you said is true, but you don't have the proof. I have it. I'll give it to you, but if you see my face, you die. And then he said, tomorrow, or the day after, I will contact you again, but you may not see me. So the next day, I walked past that door very apprehensively. <laughs> Nothing happened. <laughs> and I went down, and I was almost outside, and there was a room like a foyer, and the hand grabbed me from behind and pulled me in, and he said, don't turn. And he gave me a pile of books. And he said, now go out and don't look back. And he said, by the way, here's a, write down your fax number. I'll send you something if you burn, if you promise to cut off the top of the fax and burn it. Because it always gives the number of where it was sent. If you promise to burn it, I'll send it to you. And then I left. And it was just a pile of books. And it had links between Catholicism and the secret societies. That's how it developed. Links between those. And I thought, whew, this is heavy stuff. And I started seeing the links and putting them together. And then one day I received a fax with all the bishops' lodge numbers and the lodges where they were. And I cut off the top and I burnt them because I promised. So I don't know who gave it to me. I don't know who the man was. It was scary. Then, when I started investigating the other things, the other secret writings, there are many things which Blavatsky writes. Now, our own people, never, never having grown up in the esoteric world, being so naive, bless their heart, would say, who the heck is Blavatsky? Wouldn't they say that? Who is she? And uh, a few years ago, it was about four years ago, I really needed some quotes from Blavatsky because Blavatsky says certain things about Bible translations and Blavatsky said certain things about Seventh-day Adventists as being the only ones who might resist this world order. But if you get the right... I have all... 
Blavatsky's writings on a CD, like you have an E.G. White CD, I can call all our writings up, but they're not all there. You don't get everything. And you can get the books, you can get them at Amazon, and you can get all the books and all the writings of Blavatsky, but not everything is in there. Only the inner circle has the actual books. And so what happened was, Okay. One last story. I needed those books. And I remembered four years ago, and I remember I'm an Adventist now for 21 years already. I remembered the Sun Temple. And I said to my wife, they will have them. Nobody else has them. And so I prayed about it and I said, okay, if I knock there and they open up for me, I'll just say who we are. But if I go by myself, they won't let me in. But if she comes along and I say, uh, I'm here and this is the daughter of so-and-so, maybe they'll let me in. And that was like open sesame. They opened the door and they let me in. And I said, I want the books of Blavatsky. He said, you can't have them. You can't have them. But he showed me other books that he had, amongst others, Bible concordances, esoteric Bible concordances, where they tell you that Lucifer is the true son of God and everything in the, in the Bible is reversed. And he also told me, now it's not the same channel because that one had died, it's another channel, and he told me that he trains the theologians of this world. That's interesting, isn't it? He trains the theologians. And then he told me he has, he's the only one who has the complete writings in, in all their original glory. And I said, but I need them. I just wanted to find one or two things. He said, you can't have them. He asked me, what esoteric group do you belong to? I was in big trouble. I said, I don't belong to any. I only know what my father-in-law taught me. And so we chatted and chatted, and then finally I was about to leave, and then he said, I actually do have another copy, but you won't be able to use it because it's in a foreign language. And he went down and he fetched it, and he said, it's in German. As he says, my heart was strangely warm. But I kept my pose and I said, oh, that's a pity. <laughs> well, perhaps I can use a dictionary, I said. Uh, I said, can I buy them from you? He said, you can't pay them. They're priceless. But at the end of the day, I walked out there with them. And just to show you how some of this information came about. And people knocking at my door in the middle of the night and saying, here's a book for you. You have it for five hours. I'm a high mason. If somebody sees this, me giving this to you, you're dead. This is our inner circle writing. That's how I got my information. Through miracles, absolute miracles. And it's been verified, not by Joe Schmo and Joe Soap, but by police chiefs, secret society agents, the highest masons in countries. I'm talking about chairmen of the boards of Freemasonry who contacted and were willing to speak to me because in their heart of hearts they know there is a problem. So that's where the information comes from. If you hear otherwise and uh, conspiracy, conspiracy, consider whether it's conspiracy or whether it is verification of prophecy. Right, now. He's given me instructions already. Good. So he wants you to be quiet. I will be. And he, he wants... So, I'll do it. Okay. For five minutes. For five <laughs> minutes. Francois, I want you to stand up. You can't... He's the boss here right now. And we want to sing. Lift up the trumpets and loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. Hear the rumbling and rejoice. 
sing, Jesus is coming again, coming again, coming again, Jesus is coming again. Do you believe that? That's a good promise, isn't it? Now, before we sit down, I'll give you just a little more instruction if some people want to do this. He's going to read another question and answer it. But if there's someone here, you know, sometimes people come to these meetings and they come in the dark. And they've been oppressed. And they come and they see the light. And the Holy Spirit works on their minds. And it changes their life. Just sitting in these meetings. If there's someone here who has had that experience, while he answers the next question, just come right up over here, meet me, and then when he's finished with his answer, then we'll let you share just briefly what the meetings, the changes come across to you in these meetings right here, okay? You can be seated. He's going to ask the next question. I'm going to meet whoever wants to come up here, right over here. It says here, please tell what resources to consult about organic farming. And how did you learn to grow such huge ve vegetables? Organic farming is really not very complicated. It's uh, very logical. And it's in that lecture that I gave um, a little bit about it. I did recently write a book on it, but... Uh, it's not finished yet. Amazing Discoveries will probably bring it out at some stage. But there's lots of information on the web, and there are lots of good books on organic farming in bookstores. The basics of organic farming is you feed the, you feed the soil and the organisms in the soil, and they in turn feed the plant. And uh, it's, it's quite long to talk about that, so I suggest you get a good book on it and start with that and then as you get more information you start implementing it. I've noticed that you quote Ellen White a lot. How do we know she is a prophet of God? I have a lecture in my oldest series, the Truth Matters series, which is called uh, God's Guiding Spirit. And in the book that I wrote, Truth Matters, which is also available at Amazing Discoveries and elsewhere, I too, I don't know, there's a whole chapter on the spirit of prophecy. Why she must be a true prophet. She has all, she fulfills every single one of the biblical criteria including the physical signs. I know that today we don't like to talk about the physical signs. And there are some who say we should downplay them, but James White didn't downplay them, he made them prominent. And he had medical doctors investigate her on the stage while she didn't breathe, or while she had superhuman strength, or while she didn't blink. And uh, these things happen publicly. And I know that her grandson didn't think that it was wrong to use the physical signs. So she fulfills the spiritual criteria, the biblical criteria, the physical signs. And then the proof of the pudding is in the eating. You pick up desire of ages and you pick up the great controversy and see if that is not the Spirit of God speaking there. Amen. We've got a testimony here. Um, well, I must say happy Sabbath to you all. Um, it's not just these meetings, but going through the Total Onslaught series, um, learning about the secret behind secret societies, and then you explaining right now how you got all these books. Um, I am a product of a family that 
My grandfather was a Shriner, making him a 33rd degree Mason. My mother's father was a Mason. My grandmother was a Eastern Star. And when I joined my fraternity at my college, I was initiated in a Masonic temple. And our ritual is completely verbatim the, the first three levels of Masonry going into my fraternity. So hearing the truth behind it, it helped me to come out of it. Thank you. It actually helped me to find truth in the message because after hearing amazing facts and hearing your lectures and um, Net 98 through Dwight K. Nelson, I came out of a drug habit. Um, I've only been a Seventh-day Adventist for a year and a half now, but this year the Lord is blessing me to um, get into AFCO this year. I haven't received my um, acceptance yet, but that's where I want to go because I want to be an evangelist and do what you guys are doing and spread the word. Yeah. I actually, I just walked back in. Um, This is how the Holy Spirit works. I was going to the restroom and I saw... um, a group of the youth sitting up there, and I've been sitting with them, talking with them for the last half hour, and just explaining to them my telling testimony, saying that's the way you preach. You show what the Lord has done to you through your life. You know, I can say October 26, 2009, I am completely sober. I was drinking every day. I was smoking cigarettes. I was selling cocaine to pay my rent. And now I'm here at your meetings. I'm reading my Bible every day. I'm praying every day. There's a whole, this, I mean, when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you and starts moving, you know, it's amazing. And I thank you. I thank you as well. I thank you all. Thank you. I want to give you a hug. While Walter asks another question, if someone else has a testimony, come up here and meet me up here as well, too. Next question. For well, one person, it's worthwhile taking all the knocks in the world. There are lots of questions here, it seems, about Trinity and the Holy Spirit. Is he really the third person? Uh, is he, what is he? How do other Bibles versions prove this? It's quite complex. Some things are revealed to man and some things not. Will we ever, this side of eternity, comprehend the fullness of the Godhood? Yes or no? No. So I see no point in grabbing one doctrine and making it the be-all and the end-all of a campaign. You must see it like this or you must see it like that. How do we understand the Godhood? Is the Holy Spirit described in the Bible as a personality, yes or no? Yes, He can be grieved, He leads you, He intercedes, He can... He has emotions, He has emotions. Is Christ described as God or as a created being? God. The new translations water it down so that you uh, 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 can argue this way, but the old translations, the received texts are quite clear. God was manifest in the flesh. Not he. God was manifest. And he was the creator. He's the one who spoke. He's the one who spoke and it stood fast. So in my own mind, but this is not doctrine, This is not doctrine. This is how I try to perceive it for myself. I perceive that God is omnipresent, almighty, living in the most marvelous light. Not even Moses could see him from the front but had to be hid in the cleft of the rock and covered by the hand and could only see the glory and that from behind. So how does a omnipotent God reach out to his creation? He reaches out through Christ. And Christ 
is the Godhood made accessible to, or to man, to fallen man. So only through him who veils the glory of God can I get a glimpse of what God is about. And the Spirit of God is that which works in and through us to empower us to recognize Christ, salvation in Him, and through be obedience through His empowerment. So that it's never me. I must decrease, He must increase. Be careful, very careful. Oh, thank you for the help. To make him altogether such as we are, because it cannot be. Amen. He had no propensity to sin. I would never want to elevate myself to the position where I say, well, now I'm your equal. I would never want to bring him down to a position where he is my equal. He is the God-man. And I am his creation. And he is the one who saves me, empowers me, and enables me. There's nothing that I can do. How do you say? Nothing I bring, simply to the? Cross -cycling. Simply to the cross cycling. That's how I see the Godhead. If it's not uh, how everybody wants to see it, that's fine. What do you want to add, Francois? We have another testimony here. Excellent. I want to tell you that I'm very happy to see both these gentlemen. One day my wife said, uh, we turned on amazing discovery, uh, discoveries, and my wife said, do you see this man is talking? And I said, yeah, he seems to be a lunatic. <laughs> I don't want to say so much because I don't, I don't want him to pray that my, my pants will fall off. I want to tell you that I was born Seventh-day Adventist, which he said one day it could be a curse. But then, Blessed curse. yeah, but then, then when he said he wished that he would be born Seventh-day Adventist too. So sometime, you know, it's, we appreciate more when we search the Bible and then we become Seventh-day Adventist rather to be born Seventh-day Adventist. And all of my life, you know, I have studied spirit of prophecy. And I, I've been thinking about it. And I believe strongly in health message. And I want to tell you, God has been so good to me. Since last 54 years, I have never been sick. And praise God. And I have demoted, devoted my life to health message. But uh, Dr. Walter disappointed me in the first two, three lectures. He didn't say anything about the health. But then I saw another gentleman. I knew he's an archaeology professor. But then I could not recognize because when he talks on TV, he has a beard up to here. I said, is that the same man? Or he is 20 years younger than before. So I asked, I asked him, how come you trim your beard? He said, my wife said, she won't kiss me anymore if I continue to have that. So I see transformation, and I see some reformation here too, and some revival also. So I want you all to pray about me because I want to launch this ministry in health ministry so I can continue to be used by God. Thank you very much. Ah, the question of feasts. Should we keep Christmas? Should we keep Easter? Should we keep all of these feasts? There are lots of questions here on that issue. Well, Jesus, was he born on the 25th of December? No. no. And the Feast of Ishtar? <laughs> Do we have to keep it? 
Where do you read about Easter bunnies and eggs in the Bible? Nowhere. Nowhere do you read about them. But we do have some statements that we shouldn't offend unnecessarily when it comes to issues of Christmas and that we should be clever as serpents and gentle as doves. What I always used to do or what we used to do in the house we used to say we don't need Christmas in the house. But kids are funny. They want Christmas, don't they? Everybody else has Christmas. By the way, is there anything wrong with putting a tree in your house? Who made the tree? God made the tree. But if my tree becomes an object, an idol, it's a problem. But I don't need a tree in my house. I don't need a tree in my house. So I used to tell my kids, or we, my wife and I, we used to tell our kids, listen up, we'll make a compromise. We'll give you money as much as we would have possibly spent on a normal Christmas. And the first day after Christmas when the stores open, when they have their mega sales, you can go and spend your money and buy whatever you want. And they said, but everything will be gone. I said, no, it never will be. And then we did that, and the first Christmas that that happened, we let them loose in a big superstore with this money. They roared through it like a hurricane and came back so excited because all the things that were so expensive just three, four days before were now ultra cheap, and they got three, four times as many things as they got before. After that, they could never wait for Christmas to be over to go shopping. <laughs> so that's how we dealt with it. But it is a sensitive issue, and I don't want to be prescriptive. We're going to get the side now. Good. Well, I thought there should be a girl that should come up and share. Um, this morning you shared of a young a uh, special needs man that came and put his head at your chest and was an angel for you. I am here on vacation. At home, I have two adult children who have autism, and my husband is at home, and this is my week of vacation to come spend a week with my aunt. And she, I booked this ticket a while ago. And just recently, she, as I'm talking on the phone door, she tells me, Walter Weith is here the same time. I was overjoyed and excited to have this opportunity to see you in person, hear you speak, because you were in my living room at home. And it ministers to me, because my life parenting two very special needs individual presents a lot of challenges, and there are differences in my life because of that. As you spoke today, you have given me a hope in my heart. I have carried a lot of frustrations and burdens for the differences that, and the path that I am in. But I will go home from this holiday, this vacation, renewed, rejoiced, and different. Because you have taught me that I can love other people and not be worried about what they are doing that may be different or, in my idea, not up to standard or wrong. But you have taught me that I can love them, I can accept them, and I can choose to make my choices for God. And I'm very happy for that and happy to share this testimony. I'm a little nervous. My heart is still pounding. But I want to thank you and thank you for your ministry on... TV because I saw you there on TV and I said, I like this guy. Now I meet you and my heart is strangely warmed. <laughs> Thank you very much. May God bless you. And now this, this testimony relates to what she had to say. I'm Arthur Baldwin. Um, I was born autistic or with Asperger's, I'm not sure which, but um, t 
Today, there's very little evidence of it. Um, but when I was just a few years old, my mom tried all kinds of tests, and they knew something was different about me, but no, they weren't sure what. And um, so there were many tests done. There was a spinal tap when I was four years old, and I never forgot that. Um, but anyway, through the years, God has given me the strength and the wisdom to work to overcome the disadvantages of autism, and now it's basically unnoticeable. Amen. So <clears throat> I just wanted to give this... I just wanted to say this because I know how depressing it can be having children who have that condition, and I just want to say, with God, anything is possible. Thank you. It's like you say, Eduardo, nothing is a coincidence. God wanted him to be here to give courage to that woman. This person says he was listening to a Catholic TV channel and they said that the Holy Roman Empire was established in 2009. What does this indicate? Well, they've been bringing together the Holy Roman Empire for a long, long time. The whole Union of Europe is part of the Holy Roman Empire. I don't know about the date 2009. I know that the Pope spoke in 2008 at the United Nations, and uh, that was a mega event. And the principles that he expounded there will form the basis of the New World Order, for which both your president and the papacy has been clamoring. So whether this is precisely correct or not, it might be a perception of that person, but historically, uh, I wouldn't be able to say it's not so, but not to say that either that it's absolutely established. Time will tell. In the Old Testament, God allowed men of God, David, Abraham, Solomon, and many others, to have multiple wives. In the New Testament, Paul in his book, Timothy, said that elders and deacons should be the husband of one wife. Does God still allow men who are not elders and deacons to have multiple wives? <laughs> I think that's wishful thinking. What do you do? <laughs> well, the president of my country doesn't think so. He has multiple wives. He has four wives. In the beginning, God permitted the marriage of brothers and sisters. Right down to the time of Abraham, Abraham married his half-sisters. And then when you come later on and you read what Moses wrote, his laws... And then there was a greater separation and you weren't allowed to marry early families. Now genetically that makes a lot of sense. When Adam and Eve came forth from the hand of God, they were genetically immaculate. There were no perfect imperfections. So marrying a brother or a sister would make no difference, leave no hereditary aftermath. But then as sin brought misery and mutations and change. Over time, disease and genetic disease increased. And then if you were inbreeding, then whatever there was would be passed on to the posterity and you could have this sad situation spread across the entire clan. And so as time goes on, he separated it more and more. In the beginning, it seemed God permitted multiple wives. And even still in the time of Abraham, Abraham was not 
openly rebuked, although the situations that developed rebuked him, didn't they? So obviously something like that was never in the order of God because else he would have not created Adam and Eve, but Adam and Eve's. He only created Adam and Eve. And later on, as more and more and more light of the gospel came to light and the prophets started speaking, God's will was again established. And by the time you get to the New Testament, it says you, must, you should have one wife. One wife. And uh, I think one is all I can handle. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> but if you want to follow the path of Abraham and sit with that nagging and that stripe, then go for it. <laughs> this question is specifically addressed to me. Do you believe that we as Seventh-day Adventists should not pay our tithes to the SDA conference because of their union with the World Council of Churches? No, I do not believe that. The tithe does not belong to me. The tithe belongs to God. I have no right to say where it goes because he has already said where it goes. The tithe goes into the storehouse and it's for the Levite. Now, there might be some in a conference who are not doing what is right in your perception. Do you then withhold the tithe from the Levites? If you withhold the tithe from the Levites, then some of the Levites will have to be laid off. If the conference is already not doing what you think they should be doing, which of the Levites do you think they will let go? Those that are in harmony with them or those that are not in harmony with them? Bring all your tithe into the storehouse. I don't even work with independent ministries that solicit tithe. I wouldn't work with them because that would be robbing God and I would be condoning it by my action. I pay my tithe, even if I pay it with tears, I'll pay it. And God will bring to reckoning those who misappropriate tithe, but I am not the judge of what is what. I wish we could keep on going. There we go. I wished we could keep on going, but we're under a time restraint. And so we appreciate so much the time that, that you have taken. And uh, my little buddy, you've spoken very well this afternoon. <laughs> they took his mic away. It's amazing how he quits talking when you take the mic away. I want to invite Ray Clutie to come up here, if he would. He's got to do his last-minute things here. I tell you what, in putting all of this together, here he comes behind me. You can turn that on. In uh, doing all these things, one pastor in one church could never do everything that we've done to be able to put this program together. It took a lot of effort, and I really want to thank Ray. Um, because he has really been working with me sometimes against me. I, I've got his email address down pat. I know when my cell phone rings, I can automatically say, Hello, Ray, because I know it's, it's him. But uh, he's been a blessing to be able to help in working together. People are asking me, can we do this next month? Absolutely. Well, I tell you, I he's so positive. He says, "Absolutely, I'm worn out." I thought I thought I had a wonderful privilege of being able to thank everybody, and um, you guys have all made it such a tremendous success. It's been it's been like being surrounded by family, you know. 
and it's sort of a foretaste of heaven. Um, so please forgive me if I omit anyone or any function that I might have overlooked because everybody has been so involved. Um, thank you to the children in particular. They've been so good, haven't they? They've just been splendid. And the watchful eye of their parents and the kind hands of their mums and dads, that's just been wonderful. Um, then I want to thank the Filipino church, the pastoral staff, the general staff, the custodial staff. It's just wonderful to have clean bathrooms. Amen. And, uh, Amen. They've just done such a wonderful job. You know, the little niceties that you see, the flowers, the clipped grass, the clean windows, they've done a marvelous job. Um, the audio-visual team, we've been bedeviled by so many incredible technical setbacks, but they've doggedly really overcome them by the grace of God, and it's just been simply wonderful. They've been such a sterling and reliable team. Um, thanks to the Beaumont Church, of course, for the members for fronting. <laughs> Absolutely. The members who fronted it, obviously supported it, worked so diligently. Thanks to Lynn Jenkins um, for handling matters financial, and David Petrona. Peter and Katie Schwelt for the music and the musicians. Colin Ingrid Schwelt for the hospitality of the guests. Um, then Nate and Leah Liu, their parents, Dennis and Ada Domingo, for their wonderful support and hospitality for the San Diego leg. Um, that was also an incredibly blessed time we had in San Diego. Also, a big thank you to Lenny Hall, who also helped so, so graciously down there. Of course, I want to thank my wife, <laughs> oh, yeah. Matthew, Luke, and Josh, who have also been a tremendous inspiration. Um, their patience and their fortitude. Um, in particular, I want to thank Luke. You know, Luke was the, the one behind the scenes actually pushing his dad, saying, Dad, we've got to do it, we've got to do it, we've got to do it. So that's Luke. Um, Pastor Bob, for your incredible support. <laughs> Wonderful. Bob is a tremendous spiritual mentor and um, always so tremendously positive. Not forgetting Jean, his wife, who, in my way, epitomizes the ideal pastor's wife, always ready and willing to do something with a gracious smile. Thank you, Jean. Now, of course, Francois and Walter... Thank you so much. We've been blessed beyond measure. Absolutely. Your insights and your company, as always, just wonderful. Despite the grueling schedule and a very tough task, Master, they've really worked. They've really worked. Um, Apologies for folk who've requested personal time with them. This hasn't been possible. Some days we're out, out of the house at quarter to, quarter to eight and don't get back till late at night. So apologies if we couldn't meet with everybody. A huge thanks, of course, to our loving Heavenly Father who obviously answered tremendous prayers, many, many prayers. And this is really a result of many miracles, both large and small. Folk, we've just, in essence, had a bit of a glimpse of what things could be like on an ongoing basis. So I challenge each and every one of you to take a little bit of this flame that you've experienced here, wherever you go, and let's make a raging fire wherever we go, because God's coming soon and we're on the borders of Canaan. That's right. Until then, of course, please accept our love, our thanks, and God's richest blessing to each and every one of you. Amen. Thank you. Oh, okay. You have a um, okay. If any, um, have you all filled out those little contact cards? If, every, if you've all sent out the contact cards, I'll tell you what our intention is. Our intention is to make all these DVDs available to each and every one of you at a very nominal cost, just to basically cover the cost of shipping. Right. This will all be handed through the Beaumont Church. Um, then to... I believe it's going to be on the, the theox.org, uh, dot if I'm correct in saying that. You're welcome to view it there, download it. What we will also be doing 
is actually sending a full set up to Amazing Discoveries, who will probably top and tail the videos, so they'll be available through Amazing Discoveries too. Um, and that's pretty much all I have to say in that regard. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, what we want to have is a prayer of dedication, and we'd like to have, if they don't mind, Sonica coming up here and Loretta coming up here. First, I need Pastor Dan to come up here. I think he has an announcement, do you? After we have the prayer? Okay. So don't leave yet till he comes. His, his is very important. Prayer is important, but his is very important as well, too. We want to pray, have a prayer of dedication to this team because God is not finished with them yet. I don't know where they're going. But God's going to lead them from place to place to place. And this church is going to triumph all over the world. If we can get this many people to come to this venue in Loma Linda, California... Where there's option, let's uh, opposition. Let's let's be honest. This message is going to go through, and wherever you go and wherever we go, we're going to carry this across this nation, across this world, and we appreciate this the strength. So I'd like to have you, if you can, if, to kneel here as we pray together. Do you mind? Oh, Father, as we kneel here together and as this team holds on to each other, I pray that the congregation reaches across and touch someone next to them as well, too. For we want to lay on hands and not only dedicate this team, but dedicate ourselves. Dedicate ourselves to be your messengers in this world. Wherever they go, you will lead. Wherever they speak, miracles will happen. But it gives us confidence in knowing that wherever we go, you will go with us. And wherever we speak, miracles will happen as well, too. Anoint us all with your Holy Spirit as we're willing to die to self and allow the Spirit of Christ and his character to shine forth. For we are a commandment-keeping people who believe in the spirit of prophecy, and also we have the faith of Jesus Christ, our Lord, for we pray it in his name. Amen. Amen. God be with us till we meet. kind of like you. My heart is strangely sad. But as you enter the new Jerusalem, turn to your right, walk to the tree of life. And let's eat some of the leaves for the healing of the nations. You've enriched my life. Thank you so much. Tzafut danem.
I must say, you have encouraged us. You never know what's ahead of you. You never know how dark that tunnel is you have to go through. But you have made it all worthwhile. Thank you very much. Amen. Pastor Dan. This is Pastor Dan Bologna, the associate pastor here at this church. He's got a great announcement. <laughs> I don't know how great it is. It's just great to be up here with you. On behalf of the Loma Linda Filipino Church, I want to thank Pastor Bob, Brother Ray, Pastor um, Kyle. This is the first time Loma Linda Filipino Church has pa- partnered with Beaumont SDA Church and Mentone SDA Church, and we look forward to future partnership. All right. Pastor Francois and uh, Dr. Walter, um, this church as the host church um, has had the privilege of having the most people come to our facilities. We've had at the high numbers of 1,500 people come, and so we praise the Lord for that. And our heart is also strangely warmed. Um, I'm going to turn it over, but uh, it's not done until I make this quick housekeeping matter, okay? And that quick housekeeping matter is that we need 30, uh, 40 strong men, strong men, and maybe a few strong ladies, I don't know, um, but we need to take down over 1,200, 1,500 chairs. And so um, as we dismiss, if I can have those men come up front, and I will give you instructions on how to do that, that will be the last housekeeping church. And again, on behalf of Loma Linda Filipino Church, we want to thank you. You have blessed us, and we look forward to future partnership with you. Thank you, thank you I don't want to mention a few names, but I'm going to mention just four names, and that's Nad and Leah for looking after us in San Diego for making us feel so much at home with all your friends that came along to prepare the food. Thank you, that was very special. And then Ingrid and Carl, you have been absolutely lovely to us. Thank you, Ingrid, for all those hugs every morning. Thank you for the fresh juice. And thank you for making us feel at home. And Ray, for carting us up and, up and down, up and down, always ready to take us where we need to be. Thank you. I agree. Woman of few words. You're dismissed. Those that can stay to help take care of the chairs, see Pastor Dan over here, and he would appreciate all the help because he doesn't want to do it by himself. <laughs>